Through the decades, Japanese cameras have captured the world. Enduring generations of change, transitioning from black and white film to color film to digital and beyond. Cameras are some of the most important tools in helping connect us together visually. Whether it's documenting an unforgettable trip, helping a streamer capture their next viral moment, or reliving memories of a bygone era. In today's world, many take cameras for granted. We've got them on our phones, tablets, laptops, or sitting in a desk drawer. They become so advanced and easy to use, you just point and shoot. There's the elite craftsmanship that goes into the German-made Leicas, Hasselblads, and whatnot. They have a long legacy of taking high-quality, crisp images, but at an insanely high price point. Reserved for professionals, serious hobbyists, and people who love to spend a lot of money. But Japanese camera companies are a little different. Sony, Nikon, Canon, Fujifilm, and more. They're focused on putting a camera in every person's hands. And for that reason, these companies have continually sold well and had a major impact holding 87% of today's digital camera market. Creating some of the highest quality, life-changing, and fun pieces of tech ever made. From the high quality medium format camera, like the Mamiya RV67, trendy film emulation powerhouses, like the TikTok famous Fuji X100V, or even the camera I'm shooting this very video on, the Sony ZV-E10 Mark II. But why are so many of these top cameras produced in Japan? Why are these companies so special and everlasting in the camera world? cover all of this and more in today's episode of Dan's Planning. But before we get started, I want to remind you to like, comment, and subscribe for more content about Japan from your pal Dan and my pal Dano. So let's get started. Crazy to think, but the first ever camera arrived in Japan in 1848 on a Dutch trading ship. And the first ever image was taken in 1857 thanks to Ichiki Shiro, a retainer of the feudal lord of Satsuma who is fascinated with Western technology. This image taken on a daguerreotype camera is the first ever photo taken by a Japanese person. Due to lens limitations and technical knowledge, the image is blurry, but nonetheless amazing considering it was created decades before the light bulb. That's content creation. Prior to the 1850s during the Edo period, Japan's ports were extremely closed off. Meaning only specific countries like the Netherlands could import goods into the country. In 1858, thanks to a national trade opening called Kaikoku, more Western technology, including cameras, began trickling into Japan slowly. The first photo studios opened four years later, beginning a new era of Japanese photography. But these early daguerreotype cameras were extremely tough to use, needing a high level of technical and chemical knowledge that few people in Japan possessed. Regardless, photographers began taking long exposure shots of both landscapes and people. The equipment was largely coming from Europe, specifically Germany, from optics and glassware companies like Zeiss and Voigtlander. It was extremely expensive and still super difficult to import these cameras, especially as a desire for amateur photography began to grow in Japan. At the turn of the 1900s and into the following few decades, Japanese optics companies started creating cameras of their very own, like Nippon Kogaku KK, which we know as Nikon today. Nikon rose to popularity by imitating German lenses with cheaper materials. Cameras were seen as knockoffs overseas, but still reached thousands in Asia, where acquiring German cameras and lenses was almost impossible. The 1930s were when the camera market in Japan really started to gain some traction. This is where Canon entered the fray. Originally known as Precision Optical Laboratory, they created the Quanon, the first ever 35mm camera with a focal plane-based shutter. Olympus, a company originally known for optical instruments like microscopes and thermometers, entered the camera market around this time with the Semi Olympus 1. So now Canon, Nikon, Olympus and more are creating cameras for professionals and hobbyists alike. These smaller, more user-friendly cameras made use of new 35mm film as photography became more of an on-the-go activity instead of having to set a whole studio up. Japanese camera production would come to a halt when the Second World War began. These companies had to refocus their efforts on producing optical equipment for the war. Due to there being a great deal of aforementioned cameras in Japan, the war there was well documented, largely from professional military photographers and journalists. Following the Second World War, two developments happened in regard to Japanese camera manufacturing. Firstly, Germany was decimated and divided after the war, and many factories that produced cameras in East Germany were taken over by the Soviet Union, severely delaying their once masterful camera production. This created a large gap in the market for a new player to enter. Japan was in a period of rapid reconstruction, so Japanese camera companies could finally get back to making cameras. Many GIs were stationed in Japan and created a market for Japanese camera companies to essentially sell cameras to them as a domestic export. They took these user-friendly film cameras home to America with them, visually cataloging their time overseas with these newfangled mementos. Companies like Nikon, Minolta, and Canon now began gaining international traction over German camera makers, positioning them to succeed as camera technology advanced in the mid-century. 
In the 1950s, Japan's economy gained a boost from the Korean War, as well as their own aforementioned national reconstruction. They continued creating optical technology, as well as cameras used by photojournalists across the globe. The jarring clarity and high contrast black and white imagery painted a darkly vivid picture of the war through this journalistic medium. Around the news media industry, Japanese cameras became a standard for their portability, ease of use, and increased availability. In 1954, Nikon signed with American optical dealer Joseph Ehrenreich, who ultimately became responsible for popularizing the Japanese camera in the United States. Ehrenreich's company heavily marketed the cameras as high quality pieces of technology. These promotions helped overshadow the idea that Japanese cameras were cheap copies of German cameras. The 1950s also saw the introduction of Japanese SLR cameras, meaning single lens reflex cameras, from companies like Asahi Pentax, Yashica, and Canon. The Nikon F had a full line of interchangeable accessories and is generally regarded as the first Japanese system camera. In the 1960s, Japanese cameras had truly become a common everyday household object. They were sturdy, dependable, and always in development with new features like auto exposure. Slowly but surely, photography became less for the professional and more for the average person. Whether it's a family documenting their children growing up, a sideline photographer capturing sports greatness, or the beginnings of film video cameras capturing short bits of motion and sound. As the decades went on, Japanese cameras began evolving, sometimes for better and sometimes for worse. Build quality went on a downward trajectory as cameras became lightweight and seen as disposable things because of instant photos like Polaroid and disposable film cameras. Cameras became less metal and mechanical and more plastic and toy-like. Japan historically has been great at producing toys made of cheap materials like tin toy cars and robots or soft vinyl kaiju monsters. They were able to innovate on the design of these more fun cameras even as the quality of the materials went down. The film cameras were about to take a major hit thanks to a key development made in the Kodak labs, something that would eventually lead to Kodak's downfall. Just like toys, Japan is extremely successful in the consumer electronics world as well. Whether it's televisions, radios, CD and tape players, and more. So when it became time to take photography into the digital world, they were well equipped to succeed. From the late 90s to the early 2010s, the era of the Digicam reigned supreme. Fujifilm and Sony saw success along with evergreen favorites like Nikon and Canon. Companies like Kodak and Polaroid soon began to struggle, eventually going bankrupt, unable to pivot into the digital world. So now Japan has gained true market dominance. But why did they succeed where others faltered? Japan's success in consumer electronics stems from a robust culture of innovation and research. The relentless pursuit of top-tier research and development has allowed Japanese camera companies to push boundaries constantly. Quality and craftsmanship are deeply ingrained in Japanese working culture, contributing significantly to the country's reputation in camera production. These cameras became known for their reliability and durability, which are the result of meticulous attention to detail and a commitment to excellence. Government support has also played a crucial role in Japan's camera success. Policies that encourage industrial growth have provided a conducive environment for companies like Canon, Nikon, Sony, and Fujifilm to thrive. So this brings us to today. While most people simply use the extremely powerful cameras on their phones, a gigantic camera market exists for content creators, hobbyists, professionals, and amateurs. For people seeking to go a bit deeper than their iPhone camera can take them, companies like Canon, Nikon, Sony, Fujifilm, and more are creating extremely powerful digital cameras capable of capturing cinema-like video quality and taking extremely sharp color and black and white photos. Today we're extremely spoiled by our cameras. They kind of do everything for us and come a long way since the daguerreotypes of the mid 1800s, that's for sure. When it comes to Japanese philosophy in regards to camera producing success, one phrase can explain a lot, Kaizen. Kai meaning change and Zen meaning good. The phrase means change for the better. A business philosophy that is a huge aspect of Japanese working culture, whether blue or white collar. It essentially refers to the continuous improvement of all functions of a company, from CEO all the way down to the lowest entry-level employee. In Japanese camera companies, this is seen at both a corporate and product level. Take, for example, the Fujifilm X100 series camera, originally released in 2010. Every three or four years, another camera in the line comes out and is improved upon. I have the X100V, the fifth camera in the line, which hosts a ton of awesome features the previous camera didn't have like a touchscreen, 4K video recording, weather resistance, and 26.1 megapixels. But just last year, Fujifilm one up themselves with the Fujifilm X106, a camera with 40 megapixels, six-stop in-body image stabilization, 6K video recording, and even more film simulations. It seems simple, but Japanese companies are structured to continually improve each product they release thanks to Kaizen. One thing I learned from my short trip to Japan, 
Shopping at many secondhand electronic and camera stores is that Japanese people generally take really good care of their possessions. Whether it's video games and consoles, figures, cards, or even cameras. In fact, some of the world's best secondhand stores are in Tokyo and boast an astonishing collection of incredibly well-preserved pieces of photography equipment. Personally, I couldn't believe it. In the West, small possessions like cameras are easily cast off to the side for the next thing in line. We live in much larger spaces in general and are culturally quick to move on. Seems like Japan's less individualistic, more collectivistic lifestyle leads to an overall higher value of personal possessions. Even the junk bins of these Japanese secondhand stores have cameras in completely usable condition. The film Perfect Days sums this up well for me. The main character, Hirayama, carries around a small Olympus MJU-1, which he uses on his lunch breaks to take pictures of trees and the sky. He keeps the camera from the early 90s in pristine condition in his pocket. It's one of his prized possessions in a way as getting his photos developed and organized is one of his main hobbies outside of his janitorial job. He doesn't have any other camera gear, just the simple point and shoot camera. And that's all he really needs. No fancy lenses, lights, developing equipment, just the Olympus MJU-1. My final point in Japanese philosophy is their dedication to staying on trend when it comes to cameras and photography as a whole. For example, the price of film and development today is outrageous. I probably don't need to tell you that if you clicked on this video. Companies like Fujifilm and Ricoh have responded strongly to this with cameras that come with built-in, customizable film simulations, helping users achieve the film look digitally. Personally, I'm a huge fan of shooting like this. When I was a Tumblr Flickr teen, I was taking 35 millimeter film photos like 12 or 13 years ago when film prices were way more affordable. Plus you could go to a pharmacy, CVS or Rite Aid and get them developed for like five or $10. The film look is something I find very important in my photography process. That's why I have the Fujifilm X100V and the Ricoh GR3. And speaking of being a sucker for new camera products, the one I'm shooting this very video on right here, the Sony ZV-E10 Mark II, perfect for vlogging and content creation. Sony clearly saw a burgeoning market forming in the content creation space and decided to make a camera that was perfect for it. This camera has great picture quality, small size, and decent audio capturing as well. Clearly Japanese camera brands have their eyes on all types of audiences and are constantly fine tuning the purpose and design of their products to meet modern photography and videography needs, no matter what they might be. Thank you for coming with me and my pal Dano over here on this Japanese camera and photographic journey. We both really appreciate it. Hopefully now you understand why your camera's Japanese. I'll see you next time. Peace out.